That very night, all the borders were closed, and that was the end of that. 1933, America. Franklin Delano Roosevelt reforms the economic banking system, ending the Depression. In Germany, Adolf Hitler takes the office of chancellor, ending democracy at once. 1938, German troops occupy Austria on March 12th. They are met without resistance. People welcome Hitler, a son of Austrian soil, as a hero. October 30th, 1938. Mass hysteria rises in the United States over a radio broadcast performed by Orson Welles about a fake war of the worlds. In Austria and Germany, Jews experience real-life terror. On November 7th, an enraged 17-year-old Herschel Greenspan shoots at German diplomat Ernst von Rath in Paris. From here on, Germany and Austria are in the clutches of skillfully orchestrated violence against Jews, beginning with what is known as Kristallnacht. This was in November 38. The Nazis had been in Vienna for since March. And of course, being Jews, we uh, were all uh, braced for something, but didn't expect that. It just so happened that uh, four days before, roughly four days before Kristallnacht, there was an earthquake in Vienna, a small one. My bed was shaking. And I thought it must be another earthquake. And that's what we thought was the quaking earth was really the impact of enormous axes coming down on the pews and the Torah scrolls of the synagogue with such power and such fury. And we looked out the window and, and there was nothing going on in the street but in the courtyard. Through the broken window of the courtyard windows of the ground level synagogue came flying fragments of the pews and other furniture of the synagogue. They hacked it to pieces and then threw it through the window. And we were really the only Jews in the building and we knew that we couldn't escape, that if they did this, they were certain to come upstairs. Everybody remembers the march in by Adolf Hitler uh, in an open top car, the crowds surrounding him, the adulation. That's the moment where Austrian Jews began to sense, A, that what had happened across the border was now going to happen to them. But remember, what happened in Germany took place over five years. What happened in Austria took place overnight. A man, I still remember his name, Kreitzer, came and to my father and said, Herr Director Wagner, uh, you, you pack, pack your stuff and go home. And my father said, what are you talking about? And the man evidently said, well, you're not the director anymore. Go home, and we were taking over. You have no business, and uh, the business will be taken over by us, and uh, you can go home, and uh, that's all there is to it. My father said, keep calm, and I'll do something that will make us feel better. We didn't know what it was. My father was incredible. The quaking stopped. And then we heard the uh, sounds on the stairs. And my father said, cover your heads to me and my little brother. And then he started to pray. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Very slowly, you know. Uh, and uh, it was, it really scared as we were some part of me was less scared because of that. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism even then, uh, you know, in the 20s. And I remember that I had to run home after school immediately because there was a whole gang of 
uh, anti-Semitic kids who wanted to beat me, you know, um, they, they took off their leather belts and uh, if and when they could, they, they beat me with it. Uh, but I had a friend who lived in the same house, who was, a, was an, oh, not a Jewish kid, but a Christian, and he always, he was very strong and he defended me. And the irony is that when uh, the Anschluss came and, uh, you know, the, uh, overnight the Jews were free prey, uh, it was his father that evicted us from our apartment. Uh, the day of the 9th of November, I only remember that I did, I went to some offices or some government places to, for something or another. I, I've forgotten exactly what. Uh, but when I came home uh, to the Lampus and the Kasslergasse, uh, I think we had something to eat and the doorbell rang and a couple, obviously in, in terrible condition, crying and shaking, came in and said, the Nazis came to our house, to our apartment, and uh, said we had to leave. It wasn't ours anymore. And we should go to the Lompels, they have a big flat. And uh, so take some clothes and take a toothbrush and, and get out of here. And there was nothing they could do. If you arrest 30,000 people, it's not like they come, they read you your Miranda rights and they say, you know, uh, you have the right to remain silent, you, you know, have the right to an attorney. They arrested you, they knocked down doors, there was, you know, banging at the doors. They came, they came for people, they arrested them, they pelted them as they were walking in the street. It must have been in the evening sometime when my mother, father-in-law, I don't remember, uh, called at, at, the, at the brothers, Dr. Lampo, Sam Lampo, and, and wondered how he was doing. And his wife came to the phone crying and sobbing. What happened was that while he was gone, visiting his patients in the hospital early in the morning, coming back to his private practice, which in Vienna was next to his, uh, his living quarters, his apartment, and everything was demolished. It was totally vandalized. Everything was broken, everything was cut up, and uh, both in his office as well as in his uh, apartment. And he was so desperate that he killed himself. When his wife came home, after she probably did her morning shopping, which was customary, uh, she found him. In, in their apartment, dead already, and with a note saying, uh, Dear Mitzi, uh, you will probably be better off without me. Uh, you're not Jewish, and it will save you a lot of trouble. About 20 minutes later, my father comes in, looking very strange, and said, I have two minutes to say goodbye. They came into my office and they said, take whatever you can fit into a little satchel and then you'll have to come with us. And I said, can I say goodbye to my family? And he said, they said, okay. He says, they're waiting outside. And he embraced my mother and my little brother and we all cried and he embraced me. And I was really absolutely terrified. And then with a very straight and kind of fierce face, not crying at all, walked to the door, and at the door he turned around and he said, Fritz, that's me, come here. And I came to him, sobbing, and his hands came down on my shoulders, and he said, if I don't come back, you are going to revenge me, and turned around and left. Five days later he wound up in Dachau, he was held at various places, and it was about ten days later that we got the first postcard from Dachau. All it could say was, uh, I'm well, I hope you're well, and you can send me up to 20 marks in money order so I can buy chocolate and cigarettes. And. Uh, Every day we hoped and prayed uh, he would come back. 
very few survived uh, with us. You know, every night you you heard shots because young people tried to cross the border in the dark. And this was an impossible way of living. So they, they said, either we die or or we make it. And uh, so uh, they were dead. You know, the people were shot and other, others escaped. I must admit one thing, that having gone through the horrors of leaving everything that I was familiar with, leaving everything that was dear to me, leaving everybody I knew, but maybe looking forward to join my husband to be and his brother, who gave me enough strength. And then this wonderful woman in Oakland, who although she had never, she never knew me, she only had met my father on a trip to Egypt. And she wrote me that if you're anything like your dad, uh, I'd be happy to send you an affidavit of support. So we had very close relatives and um, they came to Vienna with Czech citizens. We could cross the border into Austria easily and uh, they hatched out a, a scheme. At a certain moment, they would bribe the uh, Slovak border guards. And at that moment, we'd have, we had, had to appear. So this was timed exactly. So my father had this Unbedenklichkeitserklärung already. We traveled uh, by taxi to the border, which was, wasn't too far. And we, we got out and we waited for the exact moment. And uh, then uh, we crossed over. And instead of checking our passports or our luggage, as these people are supposed to do, they turned their backs to us. And there was a car waiting, the motor was already running, and we got in and we were saved. I think uh, having be been kicked out of Austria was the best thing that ever happened to me. If God, God forbid I had been an Aryan, that would have been worse. Because, uh, you know, I would have been uh, uh, recruited into Hitler's foolish war. And uh, who knows what I had, uh, would have returned. Many, many didn't. It was in December that my mother got a phone call from one of my father's lawyers who said, I received a phone call from another lawyer. I can't mention his name. But he said, if Herr Mandelbaum, that's my father's name, would sign a certain paper saying that the turnover in his factory in the year 1937 was below a certain number of shillings, something of advantage would come to Mr. Mandelbaum. Indeed, uh, in the camp, Someone came to him from on the Nazi side. He was not an SS man. My father said he had a big Nazi badge, but it was, of course, it was the consent of the uh, camp authorities, and he signed that paper. So both of these things apparently reached the Nazi authorities, and sometime also very early in the morning, it was around February 2nd or 3rd, 39, the doorbell rang, and there was my father, looking like a skeleton deeply tanned because he had to work in the winter sun in the Bavarian Alps in some quarry and he was alive and with us and that's had in that sense a happy ending.